that, I'm pointing if you're listening to us, is Paul Sartorelli. That he, you made me sound like an abstract <laughs> object there. <laughs> that <laughs> ball of flesh, <laughs> that flesh and bones, he's just a talking head. <laughs> he's not a human being. He's not made in the image of God. He's just a mass. And the longer you listen or watch today, you'll notice that. <laughs> no, seriously. Um, I'm Mark Pennell, and uh, this mass is Paul Sardarelli. <laughs> Let's start over again. No, no, no. This is really? good. You like it? This is as fresh a take okay. as you can possibly have. <laughs> this is a fresh take. And I am, I guess I'm the host. Is that what I am? And you're the, yeah, you're the we're, just, we're just two friends chatting about life and Christianity and s spiritual things. And I want to be the host. Okay. <laughs> we're, we're getting very Catholic here, you realize. We've talked about a mass and the host. Okay. I grew up Roman Catholic, so I know many of the, the uh, elements of the Roman Catholic faith. Many of which you'll never hear me bash it, by the way. Let me just say that. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I am reformed. I'm uh, I, so I side with Martin Luther right. when it comes to the Protestant Reformation. But I just thought I'd get that out. I'm glad you straightened that out. Okay. The next show is going to be in Latin. <laughs> Gosh. And I won't be here. <laughs> All right. Just a little bit of history about I thought this was fascinating. We're doing the Ten Commandments, just so you know. Right. This is seven. Do not commit adultery. OK, I won't. All right. There, we're done. I thought it was interesting. I was looking it up. We, we, we think of the the old cultures before Christianity as being very hedonistic and, and whatnot. But I found out that the, they took adultery very seriously mm -hmm. in societies before, uh, you know, before God really started settling in on the on the, the lives of people around. They, they considered it a homicide and that it polluted the culture of their society and Offenses to the God, to the gods themselves. So this is the ancient Near Eastern yes, society. Yes, this, is, this okay. is Egyptian and Syrian culture. Okay, what do you mean they committed? You considered it homicide? They killed people for it. Oh, okay. capital offense. Capital offense. Yes, they did. Um, I did find this was interesting. That, and I'll get to that in a minute. There's a funny word that I always throw at you. It's a Hebrew word, and to look at it doesn't. You can't say it, so yeah. you you can say it. I have a great story though, and I looked it up from from Numbers five verses eleven through thirty one. Okay, the accused wife underwent a self curse ritual at the tabernacle. A woman would be forced to drink water mixed with dust from the vicinity of the tabernacle, and then uh, if the accusation was false, no harm would overtake her. However. If the accusation was true, the the woman would live under a curse where the, she had a portion of her thigh would shrivel and her body would swell. May this water bring a curse enter your stomach, causing your belly to swell and your womb to shrivel. <laughs> So it's a little bit different than what I wrote. I, uh, maybe I misquoted, but they took it seriously. They did. They took it very seriously. Now, to commit adultery in the uh, in the Hebrew word is n, comma, p. What is that word? Well, we just looked it up in the dictionary. It is it is the same as our word for adultery, and should be differentiated from our word of fornication. Okay. It is the word of uh, it is it is the breaking of the marriage covenant by a married person having sexual relations with another married person as opposed to two single people not married yet or just having a date mm -hmm. and getting involved with sexual intimacy. Uh, how, how do you say it? No, I had to look. I have to look it up again. Um, you said naop in your office. Yeah, I think it's naop. Okay. Um, so yes, I think it's. I think that's what it is. I don't have too many questions today. I tried to find questions, so I'm going to let you kind of take over. You know, I, I don't know how to feed you. You're going to be out on on your own this way because I. You know. Well, so let's start. This way, the Ten Commandments, God was giving his moral law to a people as they were beginning as a nation. Mm -hmm. 
God has was establishing several very f- firm pillars for this people as they began. Mm-hmm. The first pillar of society is their relationship to God. I am the Lord your God. You will have no other gods before me. Mm-hmm. Um, the next pillar of this society is going to be the family. Honor your father and your mother. Now, a part of that pillar of society is the marriage. And so he's going to go right to the sanctity of that marriage and say, you shall not commit adultery. So aside from the, the relational part of it, we'll get to there. Think of the stability part of it in a society where the family is stable and the marriage is stable. You're going to have a stable society. I was going to say, it has a, a sense of community. Yes. You, the, the marriage builds into a community around you. Yep. It's fascinating. Now, n- not wanting to sound like the old fuddy-duddy that remembers the good old days, but in a society where the divorce rate is 50% or whatever it is in our day today, mm-hmm. in the 40s, whatever it is, that is that is the fodder for instability in a society. And we know it in our day to day. And that's what he was trying to stop. When I was a kid, my, my parents got divorced. I was seven. Uh, and uh, my mom lost friends, uh, didn't want to be with her anymore because she was divorced, even though she was mm. the innocent one in this case. We were the only ones in our you know, immediate community that were of divorced parents. Yes. I mean, it was very strange. In I grew up, in, again, I started the show talking about being Roman Catholic background. I went to a good Catholic high school. Mm-hmm. Again, this would have been in the mid to late 70s. So now okay. you're, you're getting a feel for how old I am. And my parents... Um, my dad was, my parents were sort of a pillar in this society, in uh-huh. this Your dad community. Your dad was head of the hospital. Yep. Chief of surgery. And it was famous. Um, they got divorced. Mm. And I remember the stigma that that had on me in this Catholic school because very, not many people were getting divorced in, in this school of my peers. Not many of their parents were. And I felt the weight of it. I really didn't talk much about it. I was sort of one of the cool kids in school. I was on the sports teams mm-hmm. and um, things like that. But I kept it to myself. Yeah. And I'll tell you this, Mark. Um, I still remember we went away on a retreat, spiritual retreat. Oh, okay. I think it was the junior class retreat. And so we knew about retreats. And Coach Nera was our football coach. I didn't play football, but Nara knew all the students. And I remember he came up to me uh, at the retreat. I was sort of sitting by myself and I I must have been blue over the, my parents' divorce. He came up 14, 14, 15, something like that. He came up to me and he said, Paul, you need to know, you do not have a red D on your forehead. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And I've always remembered that. It was his way of saying, kid, you're going to be okay. D- did it affect me? It affected me like you as well. Mm-hmm. It affected me in a very significant way when my parents got divorced. Um, and yet he went on to say, it's going to be okay. And in both cases, both your parents and mine, um, I don't know how far it affected yours, but your father had an affair. Isn't that right? That's correct. And so did my dad. And so we have the basis for what this is. Yes. And let me share with you just a teeny bit about what this, this was off the top of my head. I I wrote it down last night. When it happens, there's no more trust between the man and the woman. Yes. Even leave out the kids for a second. No more trust. It's going to take a long time to rebuild it, but there's always going to be that monogram of doubt. Yep. There is this, the spouse wondering why the other would try to gain fulfillment with another person. What did I not do right? Mm. That's that's really a sad feeling. But it's a real feeling. Yes, it is. Children's lives are profoundly affected, as we were talking yep. about. Friends are forced to alter their perceptions of each involved. And in the case of my mother, pick sides. Yeah, and it, my, my family, too. Huge disruption. Okay. Huge. Okay, so let's go back. Let's back up a tiny bit and go a couple of directions now. Okay. Because adultery occurs does not 
necessarily mean divorce has to occur. So if you're listening to us now and you're maybe a victim of adultery or maybe you're in the middle of an affair, um, by God's grace and strength, the possibility for retrusting, for forgiveness, for the healing of that marriage is there. Yes. Just hear me say that. It doesn't mean often it doesn't happen, but it can happen. Mm -hmm. What's impossible for humans is still possible with God. Right. So having said that, let's go back to the beginning. Uh, uh, The last few weeks we've been doing shows on murder. And we talked a little bit about what happened um, in Texas uh, probably a month ago now. God's ideal in the garden, God created things to be perfect. Humans messed it up really, really fast. (laughs) We seem to be getting better at messing it up. Yeah, we're getting really, really good at messing it up. His 10 laws were meant for people, broken people, to live by his standard again. I say that to say, in the garden, God created them male and female. And he brought the two of them together in an ideal situation to have an ideal relationship of marriage. And in that ideal relationship of marriage, they were to practice um, sexual intimacy Mm -hmm. and the fruit of the sexual intimacy to be children and all of that. In that ideal, you have marriage. Now we are meant to take that ideal of marriage into our fallen and broken world and try to make it work as best we can. And one of the best parameters, guardrails to keep it going is this command. Do not commit adultery because it's what you said. You're breaking trust. You're breaking covenant. You're breaking the beauty of this ideal intimacy that God has made you for. Right. God talks about the bridegroom and, and us being married to the bridegroom. So when it's a divorce, it's kind of, maybe I'm reading too much of this, but isn't it kind of like we're divorcing ourselves from him when we I mean, it's it's, a, it's somewhat of a comparison that we're divorcing ourselves or, or oh, maybe I went too far in the wrong direction. Well, but. The, let's, that is the metaphor. The metaphor is we are the bride of Christ. Right. And maintain that metaphor. N- what does Paul say in Romans chapter 8? Nothing will separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Mm. So that covenant between Christ and his church, that marriage is is perfect. It's unbreakable. Christian marriage now is meant to be a reflection of that covenant. We now have a similar covenant with our brides. So in as much as this is Paul in the book of Ephesians, in as much as a husband and wife love each other unconditionally, express covenantal love and intimacy, they are a living reflection of what the bride of Christ and Christ himself are to be. When we stray from that, we are, in a sense, shattering that metaphor. Mm -hmm. What was meant to be a mirror to the world of the love of God through Christ and his church, marriage, what was meant to be a mirror to the world now becomes this distorted fun show in a circus that's a completely distorted mirror. When I don't love my wife the way God intended me to love her, um, the church and its love for Christ and his love for her will never be seen by the world. Mm. Your marriage is meant to be a picture of Christ's love for the world, for the church. When you mess up your marriage, especially when adultery occurs, it gets totally confused. That beauty is made a mess of. Uh, I'm going to... uh, uh, Let me just make it clear. I have never committed adultery. But yes, I have. Uh, The Old Testament makes it very clear about adultery. Jesus, on the Sermon on the Mount, said something that was even more, uh, uh, wow, heavy. Yes. And what was it? 
He said, you've heard it said, and he's quoting the Ten Commandments. He's heard it. You've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But then he goes on to say, and he goes right to our hearts. He says, but I tell you, anyone who even looks on another person with lust in their hearts has already committed adultery in their hearts against them. And boy, talk about speaking directly into our society. Mm. Uh, We are a society of lust. Mm. We are a society that is constantly looking on other people with lust in their hearts. I think we should do a whole show on that, but let's, let's realize the, 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 the trail, the dotted line that Jesus is making. A person doesn't wake up tomorrow and say, I think I'm going to have an affair. Mm -hmm. Something has already started in the impurities of their heart Mm -hmm. for that trail to begin. Mm -hmm. And so the dotted line of the adultery began with an unfaithful heart, with a wandering eye, with the lack of discipline of my own heart and body toward other people. And so in a society where adultery is certainly rampant, lust is even more rampant, which is the seed of adultery. And so I would just ask all of us, uh, what sort of parameters do we have in our own life to guard us from our hearts going too crazy in the area of lust and wandering eyes? And to say on a personal note, I have committed adultery probably over a hundred thousand times because of that, but there is good news. And I'm, Serious, if you are suffering from this, men especially, uh, you look at a, you know, I, I've said this before, God's greatest creation, most beautiful creation was the woman. Um, but if we look at it wrong in a lustful way, then we're, we're getting in trouble. And I have, I, I can't tell you how many times I've done that. It's amazing how far my w- mind can wander just like that. Mm-hmm. The good news is though, excuse me for interrupting. The good news is though, I have prayed about this extensively throughout the years, and it isn't that way anymore. I mean, not completely. Don't get me wrong. I can find myself getting to that. But God has released me from that. Mm -hmm. And believe me, I'm a guy that probably dealt with that more than most men, really big time. Yes. And yet I'm, I'm able to look now at a woman and see her beauty as God intended and not think, gee, I'd like to have sex with her. If you're listening to that, listen to that. I didn't know he was going to say that, but that is such an important thing to say because I'm afraid in all the world and even in the Christian world, we're not willing to say that, and we can. There's there, there are books like Every Man's Battle, which sort of just says it is inevitable for a man to lust after a woman, that he cannot win that. So, oh, well, boys will be boys. Right, right. And so, you know, even our politicians can boast about their sexual prowesses, right. and we can look beyond that. We'll, even snicker about it. Yes. Wrong. The answer to this problem, again, it's the, it is the dotted line between the heart and the action of adultery. So instead of just saying every man's battle, let's go back to how did God create us? He created us for intimacy. Mm-hmm. And hear me say this. We can put governors on our computer. We can put all kinds of things to keep us from looking at porn sites or whatever. We're not solving the problem. Right. We're just becoming Pharisees. Right. What you just said, go back and listen to what he said, God created us for intimacy, two ways, intimacy with him and intimacy. If you, if you're, unless you have the gift of celibacy, intimacy with your spouse, it begins with the intimacy with Christ. And what you've described, if a person is willing to spend the the time, willing to allow the Holy Spirit of God to work in their heart and mind, that intimacy with Christ will begin to change the heart of lust, Mm -hmm. the heart of stone into a heart of grace Mm -hmm. and a heart of love Mm -hmm. so that we don't walk with blinders on, but we can love people the way God loves them. Intimacy with Christ is the solution number one to the to the the problem of lust intimacy number 2 is your spouse make sure and i know there's a lot of people out there who they were married 20 years ago and they've let it slide 
Don't let it slide. Do what you can. Spend the time. Go on vacation. Go on retreats with your spouse. Do the hard work of returning to your first love of Christ and of your spouse, whether you're a man or one woman listening to this. And I'm convinced that if you uh, do this, uh, follow him, the intimacy with the one you married will be greater than you ever expected. Mm-hmm. I think sometimes Christians are are against are, are portrayed as against sex. That's not true at all. That if it's with the right person, it's a wonderful, yes. magical thing. You said it so well. Intimacy, sexual intimacy, is a gift that God gave us to be used in the in the confines of our marriage. And when that intimacy is coupled with an intimacy, a spiritual intimacy with Him. Ooh. Not only will we not commit adultery, we will be able to stop the lustful heart from going where it needs to go. It is not an an inevitable lose like our society would try to tell us. Boys will be boys. They're always going to be lustful. That may be our tendency, our leaning, but but it can be overcome. And with Christ and an intimacy with him and I would say an intimacy with your spouse, it, it can be overcome. Yeah. It, your heart can turn from a heart of lust to a heart of love, a heart of stone to a heart of grace. You touched on it before. You were talking to maybe someone who has committed adultery, maybe more than once. Um, but remember that woman that, he, that Jesus met at the well. Mm-hmm. He, 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 he forgave her. You yeah. are forgiven well if, said. You, Thank like, you. if you tell him of this burden, uh, he will forgive you. Yes, that's so important. If your marriage right now is stale, if it's cold, if the intimacy is gone, it can be recovered. It's hard work. Maybe go see a third party, go see a counselor or your pastor, but it can be recovered. You, you need to start doing the hard work of love and the hard work of communication and intimacy. It can be recovered. Yeah. Uh, um, forgiveness can happen. Intimacy can happen again. A cold marriage can get warm again, can get hot again. It won't happen overnight. But if two people are willing and the Lord is in the middle of them, it can happen. I just thought it was interesting that Luke said it. We've heard it a million times, the golden rule. Yes. Uh, Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. If you are going, if you are thinking of an affair, think of maybe your spouse possibly doing the same thing, how much it hurts you to even think about that, Mm -hmm. let alone to to actually know that it happened. Think of the pain that you've caused or are about to cause. Don't do it. Don't commit an adultery. God created you for something better. Intimacy with him and intimacy with others in a beautiful covenantal way. Don't commit adultery. Experience the love of Christ in your own life and give it to others. I like where we went with this. Thank you very much for spending your time with us. Uh, Until next time, this has been A Fresh Take.